Hello everyone, this is a uh, brief video about creating a PWM signal generator uh, circuit for the sake of reducing solenoid power consumption. During the Reed Organ, uh, I didn't have to worry about solenoids getting too hot because they didn't really stay on for too long and I could pretty easily um, stop that from happening by just not, not letting keys uh, get pressed for too long because that would mean that the solenoids wouldn't stay down for very long. But for the saxophone project, keys potentially would be held down for very long periods of time. Um, if you look at a, a fingering chart for a saxophone, they they go down like this, where each note has that key held plus all the ones above it. Uh, anyway, that's a saxophone physics thing. That's not related to this really. Anyway, um, these solenoids that I'm using for these projects, they get very, very hot in use. Um, the manufacturer claims that they draw 1 amp at 12 volts, but that's not really true. It's more like 1.3 amps at 12 volts. Um, by testing tons of them, they none of them are draw 1 amp at 12 volts, and I have over 100 of the things now. Um, if you If you do the math, that's that's what, like 16 watts of power, that's going to have to dissipate. And there's a lot of those per project. Um, for the reed organ, there were 88 of them, one per key. For the saxophone, there's probably going to be 25 or so. Um, that's a lot of power, and that's a lot of heat to be generated. It's just not an efficient way of doing it. The standard way of driving solenoids is to hit them with a lot of power at first for a tenth of a second or however much time you need and then draw back the power to sig significantly lower amount, like say 40% of the original voltage, so like 5 volts. Um, because they need a lot of power to initially push, but once they're held in they don't require a whole lot of power to stay held in. Um, and so it's stupid to just give them a full 12 volts and then if it's going to be held down for a long period of time, keep holding them down because that uses a lot of power and generates heat like I was just talking about. So an analog circuit that can do what I just described uh, needs a lot of components and it's not really realistic when you need to drive dozens of solenoids like in my projects. Um, so in my circuit board like I was just talking about I actually implemented a system that can be added later. Um, here let me get a populated one. Actually never mind. The other populate. I have one populated uh, board right here in my workbench and then that's all connected up and I don't want to mess with it and then I have another one downstairs on the saxophone itself and I don't want to mess with that either. Anyway, if we look at this board we'll see a whole row of, of, of terminal blocks go here for power, power and then eight solenoid outputs, eight solenoid outputs, then a row of diodes, then the MOSFETs and then resistors for current limiting and pull down and then header to the Arduino that's driving it all. Um, but if you look closely you'll notice that I have an additional MOSFET here and here. And if you look at what those are doing on the back, they're actually controlling the overall power flowing to each half. Coming in, you can see it go the power is going to be going up there and then it goes across the, the big bus here where it gets turned on and off by the MOSFETs and goes to the solenoids eventually. And anyway, there's two MOSFETs that are going to be controlling the overall power flowing to each half of this board. What that allows me to do is pulse width modulate those two MOSFETs while only driving these guys with simple binary. So whenever a solenoid comes on in this group, the duty cycle of this would go to 100%, and then after a tenth of a second, or however much time is needed for the solenoid to fully actuate, this would drop down to 30 or 40% duty cycle. Again, whatever is needed to hold the solenoid in. And that sounds easy to do, but you can't really make, uh, you can't really use a microcontroller very easily to do that. Um, because you need to constantly monitor uh, pins to get a pulse, and then do the pulse width modulation based off of that um, and using my existing code any any pulse is going to be way too narrow for a microcontroller to 
easily see unless we're talking about interrupts and then there's just not enough interrupt pins for this project. And anyway, microcontrollers are just not good for this. So instead I've actually come up with a dedicated circuit to do this using a whole ton of 555 timers here. Let me just get it closer. Alright, so how this works is we have an Arduino that's controlling the whole setup. We have the driver circuit that I was just talking about and then we have my standard solenoid driver board. Uh, same one on my reed organ, same one I was just showing you. And of course a solenoid. Uh, and it's being powered by a DC power supply. Um, so how this this circuit is working is we have at the top a 555 and that's generating a 50% duty cycle um, approximately it's just above it because of course with the 555 you can't have less than a 50% duty cycle it's like 53% anyway that's a 25 kilohertz a staple multi vibrator whatever that word is then down here we have a 555 one-shot circuit uh, with adjustable delay via a potentiometer and there's a transistor down here what that allows us to do is when another pulse is received it discharges through that transistor and thus it restarts the timing cycle and that's important because if another note or another solenoid was told to go down immediately after the first one had been told to go down it wouldn't start over the timing cycle with a normal one-shot circuit and thus wouldn't give us the full pulse that we need to put down that second solenoid. And then up here we have a it's a quad channel um, or gate I see and I'm only using one channel of it. It's two inputs are the PWM and the one-shot and then its output goes to the gate of the power control MOSFET, that guy. So, what the Arduino is doing, uh, I just have a test program right now, what it does is it triggers the one shot right here, you can see, triggers the one shot, so pulls it low for a really, really small amount of time and then pulls it high again, and then it immediately turns on um, the first small set which is controlling this solenoid and that's a simulation of the whole setup one is how it's going to work in final use um, all right let's fire it up so yay we have a solenoid turning on and off but if we look at this LED this is actually showing the output going to the power control MOSFET you can see it gives us a short pulse and then I don't you probably can't see that but it's then slightly dim afterwards from that 50% duty cycle um, and then of course we can adjust that time delay with this guy so make it shorter like so or make it longer and if we look at how much power this guy is drawing it works really well. Uh, it's, it's only drawing 430 milliamps, which is much better than 1.3 to 1.4 amps, uh, which is what it was before this whole setup. And it, it really does work. Um, before, after engaging these solenoids, after only for a few seconds, they were like burningly hot, and now it's completely fine after going for like a minute or so, like it's been doing. Um, yeah, that's the basic setup. Uh, one more thing I could show you. If we plug in the scope, so this is what's going to the power control MOSFET. You can see we have a nice beautiful PWM signal going through, and then every time you hear the click, it's really hard to see on this video, I imagine, but it goes up. I'm here, let me lengthen that amount of time on the one shot. There you go. Beautiful. Now you can see it. Uh, you never want it this long in real life, but you can see it well this way. Anyway, you can see that this whole setup works pretty well as a test setup. Um, so what I then went ahead and did is drew it up in Fritzing and made a PCB design of the whole thing with four channels because that's how many I'm going to need for my saxophone. Uh, I'm just going to turn this off because it gets annoying. Uh, I have two of these 
driver boards, that's how many outputs I need for the saxophone, and of course each half can be controlled, so I get a total of four channels of pulse width modulation I'm going to need to control. Anyway, if we look at this design, we have our pulse width modulation um, generating circuit here, 555, and then all the resistors and capacitors do that. We have our input, inputs here, I call them triggers in the, in the board design you can see, because uh, that's really what they are, and then power in. So that'll be powered. This whole thing will be powered off an Arduino's power. Then we have four um, 555 one-shot circuits with four little trimmer potentiometers. Um, and then we have the OR gate right in the middle. Four channels. Four channels. Perfect. And then we have the output here. And that'll go off to the f four halves. Um, it's a, it's, it looks really complex, but it's actually not. I mean, it's just that circuit um, with four one-shots instead. Um, yeah, and I did lots and lots of testing on this. Um, when I manufactured my first PCB, which was actually the, the solenoid driver board that I was just showing you, um, I, I only messed up one thing, which was these holes here for the MOSFETs aren't quite big enough for MOSFETs. Um, and so instead of actually soldering in MOSFETs like you're supposed to do, I just push fit them. Um, you can see I have the leads not very far in. That's it's supposed to be up to, you know, there instead. Anyway, um, so I don't want to mess up anything, so I've been a kind of obsessive about the amount of testing I've done to this thing before I get it actually manufactured. Um, and one of the things I did was print out um, the design and place all my components on it. That's the first draft of the design. And I had to fix some things after doing that. And this is not quite the final version that's up here on the screen, but it's pretty close to it. Uh, you can see I just, I just have some foam, foam board and I lay out some amount of my components. So I laid out basic the, the 1505 circuit there without its capacitors because this is an older design and those capacitors spacing between the leads is too small. You can see I'm not actually using a 555 but of course it's a dip 8 package, dual inline package 8 pins so it doesn't matter. Uh, and then I laid out one of the four uh, one-shot circuits and I added an LED for viewing the output of that circuit so I can see exactly what's going wrong if something goes wrong. And of course the transistor and the capacitor and all the nice things. And I, I unfortunately don't have any trim pots um, like that to actually test on this, but it's okay. I checked the data sheet and I know it's going to fit right. Um, and then headers for in and headers for out. And then some random IC that I'm pretending is an OR gate for testing. Um, once I once I know that the spacing and everything like that is right uh, from this, I mean, I have some pretty tight things like check out that resistor. Check out that resistor. I ran out of space, so I put it vertically. That's actually a standard trick, but it's still cool. Anyway, once I know that my spacing is reasonably good and that there's not anything obviously horribly wrong with anything, um, I do some electrical tests here. One of the tests, one of the things I like to do is just go to each IC and if you click on a pin, Fritzing shows you everywhere that's connected. And it's a good sanity check. So for instance, pin one on this circuit, on the, on the 555 for the pulse width modulation circuit, is connected to ground. It should be grounded. And you can see it is in fact grounded in lots of other parts of the circuit. Light up when I click it. Um, so yeah, you can just go along pin to pin. This one's connected up to a resistor and a capacitor. You can just check that on the breadboard circuit. This one is the output. This one's connected to a capacitor. This one's connected to a resistor and capacitor in pin 2. This one's connected to two resistors, etc, etc. This one's connected to pin 4 and 5 volts. These sorts of things, you can just check pin by pin, and it's a really good way of just checking that you haven't done anything terribly wrong. Uh, if you do that to each IC, you can be pretty sure you didn't mess anything up, within reason, of course. 
Then once I've done that, um, I like to use an online Gerber viewer after exporting my Gerber to view it just to make sure that fritzing isn't showing something. So you can see with another software, uh, if you look at the Gerber file in a different piece of software, you know that what you see is exactly what you're going to get from the factory. Yeah, you can just look for things like if we disable the silk screen. One of the really cool things is, or not cool things, but things you hope not to see are traces straight up overlapping each other, because uh, fritzing can make it really easy to do that uh, if you don't use the design rules check, which you should. Anyway, then once you've done that, I send it out, and that's what I've done. Did that today. Uh, I sent it to a Chinese company, or I don't even know if it's a company. Uh, someone in China on eBay who manufactures PCBs for absurdly low prices. I used PCB Way, no wait, first PCB to manufacture these guys and it was 50 bucks for 15 of them shipped my door with two day ML, which is already pretty insane. Um, but, I decided, but I decided I wanted to go even cheaper. Um, and according to their listing, this circuit board is under five by 10 centimeters. So that means it should come to a total of seventeen dollars and ninety cents for this for ten of them, plus five dollars fast for faster shipping, which I want, which is really absurdly cheap. Uh, I hope nothing's horribly wrong with it when it gets here. Anyway, yeah, this is my crazy setup. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Oh, and completely unrelated, but. Check out my resistor inventory spreadsheet I made. You input a resistance, and it automatically generates the color bands. Uh, and then I just have a quantity, and then I say whether it's new or used, because I recycle a lot of parts off of old electronics, and that's just because I know that they're, they're going to have short leads versus long leads. Anyway, the coolest part is that it'll make, make your color bands for you, so I can, like... Alright. Let's say I have a... 7.8 K resistor that is in fact going to have a blue gray red color band it just auto generated that it's pretty cool anyway